Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhuni Chinana Shri Vedic Nadhar Shri Vasadi Gaurava Purna This is backwards here because of the camera <clears throat> but it's Srila Prabhupada Nilamrita The Adventures and Pastimes Activities of A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Jai Shri Prabhupada, Jai Shri Prabhupada, Jai Shri Prabhupada. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay. So, Prabhupada has given up everything. And he's trying different things to try to carry out the instructions of his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, to spread Krishna consciousness and to preach, especially in English. <clears throat> and nothing's really working all that great. Just it's just enough of a taste. And then it doesn't work anymore. So he couldn't work with his god brothers. They, his mood was too progressive. They were a little slower, and they wanted to keep things small and just. He lost everything: his business, his money. He had nowhere to live. Um, so now he's gone to Vrindavan. <clears throat> in moving to Vrindavan, Abai Prabhupada was following his predecessor spiritual masters. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Bhakti Vinod Thakur had had their house at Radhakund and had preached in Vrindavan. Gorkashore Das Babaji, Jagannath Das Babaji, Vishwanath Chakravarti, Narutam Das Thakur had lived either in Vrindavan or in Navadvi, near the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. Even those Gaudiya Vaishnavas who do not live in Vrindavan kept Vrindavan always in their hearts and proclaimed its glories. Vrindavan is the earthly manifestation of Lord Krishna's eternal spiritual abode. which the Lord himself describes in Bhagavad Gita. There is another nature which is eternal, transcendental to manifested and unmanifested matter. It's never annihilated. It's the supreme destination. When one goes there, he never comes back. That is my supreme abode. Although Lord Krishna is abode, Goloka Vrindavan, is far beyond the material world. When Krishna comes to earth, he displays his eternal abode in the Vrindavan of India. That 84 square mile tract in North India is identical with the eternal world in the spiritual sky. <clears throat> the train arrived in Mathura. Abai stepped down with his luggage and looked around, noting the recently constructed Matura Junction building. Proceeding through the gate and out of the station, he found a Tonga driver, agreed on the fare, and started for Keshigat. For half a mile, the wobbling horse-drawn cart followed the road between the tracks and the railway yard. At the main road, they turned left, passed under a railroad bridge, and entered an open market. Piles of fruits, vegetables, and grains were displayed on the ground, their vendors sitting beside them, bartering and measuring while customers milled around. The women of Matura dressed in brightly colored saris, yellows, greens, pinks, and purples, moved busily in the market. 
The vehicular traffic consisted mostly of bullock carts, the drivers often squatting on the wooden yokes between the shoulders of their animals. Whipping alternatively one ox then the other with a length of rope joined to a wooden handle. Although this was the most populated area in the trip to Brindavan compared to Delhi, it seemed simple and rural. <clears throat> the sun was high, but the Tungus top provided a partial shelter and the summer's heat had passed. Beyond the bazaar, the road curved to the right, and Abai saw the nearby white domes of the massive sandstone mosque marking Krishna Janmastan, the birthplace of Lord Krishna. Centuries ago, invading Muslims had destroyed the large Krishna temple and created the mosque in its stead, and now directly in front of the mosque stood a newer, smaller Krishna temple. They approached the three-way junction, New Delhi, Central Mathura, and Vrindavan. The driver struck the horse with his whip, and the Tanga proceeded along the Vrindavan road, edging through a herd of white cows, the herdsman walking amongst them carrying his stick. The road was busy with Tangas and slow, creaking ox carts loaded with market commodities and pulled by squat black water buffalo. A string of small spindle-legged donkeys carried oversized loads of firewood and sandbags. <clears throat> Although much had changed in Abai's life since he had come here to see his spiritual master during the Parikram years ago, Vrindavan had remained the same. He felt he had done the best thing in coming here, leaving the heat, the traffic and fumes, the human passions of Delhi, it was a natural relief. Yet, even as he felt transcendental emotions for Vrindavan, impressions of his months preaching in Delhi lingered in his mind. The city streets and himself going from place to place with his back to Godhead's. Life in Delhi had been constant, vigorous preaching. Now, he was more than 60 years old. But he was not coming to Vrindavan to retire. He had retired from household responsibilities, but not from his responsibilities of making Back to Godhead as popular and sophisticated as illustrated weekly. He would live in Vrindavan and commute to Delhi, but he would never stop preaching. The sight of taller trees signaled the precincts of Vrindavan as the thin horse trotted along past the police station and water trough for animals. On either side appeared <clears throat> the garden courtyards, private estates, and ashrams. Fragile white malati flowers, golden marigolds, frangipani trees, <clears throat> <clears throat> red hibiscus, trees of sorrow, and many other flowers and trees, some known only in Vrindavan. <clears throat> bloomed forth in the brilliant sunlight. <clears throat> the Radha Govinda temple loomed fortress-like on his left, and opposite in the distance the high-rising tower of the Ranganath temple. They entered narrow streets, tighter and busier places with markets and city dwellings, and then it became quiet again. At the end of a narrow street by the Yamuna River near the Keshi bathing ghat stood the small and beautifully ornate entrance to the Vamsi Gopalaji Temple, a narrow three-storied building with three domes and many decorated arches. <clears throat> After stepping over the curbside drain and walking up three marble steps, Abai entered the front door, the driver following him carrying the luggage. Once inside, Abai removed his shoes and entered the courtyard, <clears throat> which was open to the sky through a metal grate on which a few birds sat two floors above. A column of sunlight lit one side of the courtyard where a potted Tulsi sat atop a pillar. 
The temple seemed cool and quiet. Adjacent to the courtyard was the deity room, its doors locked shut. Overhead was a mezzanine with rooms whose entrances were visible from the courtyard. A few saris and strips of cloth hung on improvised clotheslines. Mahant Gopal, the temple pujari, whom Abai had known since 1954, greeted him cheerfully. He was about the same age as Abai and had long gray hair and an unruly beard. Although Abai's attire was modest, he appeared well-dressed compared with Gopal, who wore only a coarse dhoti. Gopal led Abai upstairs. Coming out onto the roof, Abai smiled to see again the wonderful vista. Barely a hundred yards away, he could see the Amuna. Not only the immediate patch of water flowing before him, but to his left and right, a broad, curving sheet of river shimmering in the afternoon sun. There were sand, deltas, herds of cows and buffalo grazing, and flat, grassy banks of the Amuna, and plains and trees as far as the eye could see, and in the opposite direction was the town of Vrindavan, marked by dozens of temple spires and domes. Abai's room, the only one on the roof, was small with narrow double doors and barred windows. Sitting on the apartment's roof, monkeys with their tiny offspring sat watching unalarmed. Just outside the door, a two-foot-high cement pyramid signified that the temple deity was directly beneath. Abai entered the room. Through the barred windows, he could see the palace at Keshigat, the venerable tower of the Gopinath temple, and beyond the uninterrupted flat river, the green banks and sky. <clears throat> After acquainting Abai with the details of the room, the small kerosene burner, the rope and bucket for drawing bathing water from the well up to the roof, Gopal meticulously produced a government-stamped rental agreement. Abai wrote a short paragraph declaring himself a disciple of the late Sri Sri Mahabhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada and attesting to his renting the room for five rupees per month. Both parties agreed. After his bath, Abai took prasadam and rested. When he heard the bells ringing in the temple below, he went down to see the deities. Gopal, who had been in the temples, who had been the temple's pujari for many years and had seen its reconstruction in 1923, had told Abai that the temple deity, Bamsi Gopalaji, had been installed. 350 years before by Mahant Prahlad Das of Nimbarka Vaishnav Sampradaya. Gopal himself had installed the deity of Radharani. Bamsi Gopalji, standing in a graceful threefold bending form and holding his flute, was very appealing. He was three feet tall and of black marble. Radharani, slightly shorter, was of brass. They were simply dressed in rough white cotton and illuminated by the dim glow of a kerosene lamp. Abai could see that they were being cared for, but because of poverty, there was no opulence. He returned to the roof as the sun was setting over the town of Vrindavan. Having the entire roof's walkway to himself, Abai walked and chanted Java, enjoying the cool early evening breeze from the Amuna. Occasionally, a solitary boat would pass on the calm waters of the Amuna, and a devotee somewhere unseen could be heard chanting evening prayers at Keshigat. He felt pleased with this location in the heart of the pastimes of Lord Krishna. He was not a newcomer spending his first day in a strange town. Everything here was already familiar and dear. As Vrindavan was Krishna's abode, Abhai was Krishna's servant, the servant of the six Goswamis the servant of his spiritual master. He felt at home. <clears throat> As day turned to twilight, temple bells rang throughout the town. Abai walked to the western side of the road and looked into the city of thousands of temples. The Govindaji Temple, the Raghunath Temple, 
and thousands of smaller temples were having their Sunday Arti and Kirtan glorifying Lord Krishna. Abhai responded to the sights and sounds of Vrindavan as only a pure devotee could. His thoughts and emotions were full of appreciation and awareness of Krishna, Krishna's devotees, and Krishna's land. Naturally, he began to think of preaching, hankering for others to know the intimate peace and ecstasy of Vrindavan. Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was inviting all souls to join him in his eternal abode. Yet, even in India, few understood. And outside India, people knew nothing of Vrindavan or of the Amuna or of what it means to be free of material desires. Why shouldn't people all around the world have this? This was the abode of peace, yet no one knew anything of it, nor were people interested. But this is what they were actually hankering for. Abai thought of back to Godhead and how, by Krishna's grace, he might expand his preaching beyond India to the whole world. His god brothers, it would have been better if they had worked together in the Gaudiamat, but many of them were at least keeping regular principles. None of them, however, seemed to be doing much beyond maintaining a temple here and an ashram there, worshiping a deity, eating, and sleeping. But there was so much more to be done in broadcasting the glories of Vrindavan. Abhai chanted and thought of Krishna. Gradually, he turned to his task of producing the October issue of Back to Godhead, due to be printed shortly in Delhi. He had a deadline to keep. The next morning, after sunrise, the residents of Vrindavan were austere, bathing in the Amuna, performing puja to their deities, reciting mantras. But Abai was awake even before most, writing in stillness beneath the light of his rooftop room. As he wrote diligently in English, scriptural references appeared and took their place within convincing arguments. For hours he wrote, page after page, in an exercise book, until gradually the chirping of awakening birds signaled the end of the dark night's stillness. Soon the sun would arise. Keeping to his regular schedule, he put aside his writing, began chanting japa, staying in his room, uttering Hare Krishna mantra in a soft, deep voice. Even before the first traces of light in the sky, before the river was visible, a few Babaji's reciting prayers made, they were, made their way through the streets, heading for the Amuna. By 4 a.m., gongs and temple bells throughout the city heralded the Mongol Arti of the deity. Abai continued chanting alone for another hour. Then he prepared to bathe, lowering the bucket on its long rope and hauling water up to the roof. It was light when he went out, his bead bag around his neck, a few copies of Back to God in his hand. Turning right at the temple door, he walked the tight, crooked lane past alleys, dirt paths, and cross lanes, which interlaced in a winding network. There were no shops in the area, only silent buildings, many of them hundreds of years old. The neighborhood was serene. Behind closed shutters, someone played on wooden clackers and sang Hare Krishna softly. At a crossroad where dark women filled brass water pots from a well, Abai turned left onto a street lined with small open porches. On either side, he saw ornate temple architecture, one entrance marked by two stone lions, another a carved elephant with teeth like a tiger's. A brick and mortar wall was crumbling with age. Soon Abai arrived at the Radharaman temple, established almost 500 years before by Gopal Bhatt Goswami, one of Lord Chaitanya's chief followers. Here, residents of Vrindavan were coming and going according to their vows, following a strict schedule that allowed not a moment's delay, making their daily visit to various temples. Abai entered and stood amidst a group of worshippers viewing the deity of Krishna, Radha Raman. 
the deity wearing a fresh garland of flowers, <clears throat> his enchanting black form, adorned with bright silks and jewels, appeared very opulent. <clears throat> Knowing the priests of Radharaman to be respected, learned Sanskritists, some of them also read English. Abai had brought with him a few copies of Back to Godhead. He met Vishrambar Goswami, a young priest in his thirties, who after the death of his father had left his law practice and taken over some of the temple management. The temple was run under a caste Goswami system, and thus for 500 years, Vishwambar's ancestor had handed down charge of the temple. Although Vishwambar had met many sadhus, he was immediately struck by Abai's gentle and humble demeanor. He accepted the copies of Back to Godhead and sat and talked with Abai. Abai then continued along Vrindavan's winding lanes to visit another temple, Radha Damodar. He passed old Babaji's and women carrying water, a commercial shop beside an open porch where people worshipped a Shivalinga, monkeys sitting atop a high concrete wall and ranging from roof to roof, ledge to ledge, chattered and gestured as the by walked beneath. As the morning progressed, barefoot children had begun to appear more frequently, playing within the open doors. As he walked along, chanting japa, his right hand in his bead bag, his lips moving softly, hardly anyone in Vrindavan knew him. But as an elderly, cultured Bengali gentleman, he did not seem an unusual sight. He was a religious babu in a town devoted entirely to religion. Jai Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Yeah. Usually, I was thinking uh, Prabhupada stayed at Radha Damodar Temple with a view of Rupa Goswami's Samadhi. But here, evidently, when he first came to Vrindavan, he stayed at a temple at Keshiga. His room was on the roof of the temple with a view of other temples and the Amuna. Hmm. Hare Krishna.